Hello, I'm Jonathan M0JSX. Thanks for joining me on my channel again. Today we're going to have a look at the Dayton 2022 Hamvention. Uh, I didn't make it to Hamvention, unfortunately. Uh, I got uh, priorities at home, which meant I couldn't get out to Dayton. But I've seen enough live streams and enough videos that it feels like I was there almost. Uh, so today I'm going to go through some of the products uh, that we saw there and I'm going to give some of my opinions on them. Hopefully it's of interest. Let's start with ICOM. Uh, ICOM debuted uh, four products at uh, Dayton. Well, I suppose actually three in a concept. Let's start with that concept because the concept is ICOM's, uh, and they're calling it the SHF P1. It is almost a prototype of a prototype. It doesn't exist yet. This is very much a mock-up. But what it is, it's their super high frequency project. So ICOM are investigating, they announced last year, they're investigating doing or making a product for essentially above 23 SEMs. Uh, now, this is something that I think has caught a lot of people uh, off guard almost, but has raised a lot of interest because no, no, no one of the big manufacturers makes anything for those high frequencies. Uh, people do play around with those high frequencies, often using homebrew transverters or, uh, or the like, but it's, uh, ICOM is trying to say that this could be for the mainstream, I think. So the uh, SHFP1 was demonstrated as being essentially an IC705 type body uh, used as a controller connected to the actual transceiver which you'd mount on the masthead uh, using a LAN cable to connect the two. I like that idea, it means that you're not going to get any coax loss because you're literally putting the transmitter at the aerial. That's a really good idea. Uh, the uh, We don't have any price, we don't even know what bands this thing is going to cover yet, if it does actually make it into production. This, I think, very much showing it datum was, is there a market for this? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Hopefully ICOM have got some good feedback and they're able to make a decision as to whether to proceed with the SHF project or whether this is as far as it goes. I don't know, but I'm certainly going to follow with a lot of interest. The next thing that ICOM displayed under the glass, as it were, was the ICPW2. Now the ICPW2 is not new. We've known about the PW2 for some time. I think they first demonstrated it or announced it either Dayton 2019 or maybe even uh, Tokyo of that year. But the ICPW2, if you don't know, is ICOM's upcoming one kilowatt uh, linear amplifier. Uh, all solid state, of course, no valves involved. Uh, the advantage, of course, with this is that it will uh, seamlessly integrate with your ICOM radio. Uh, so I'm for me, I'm an ICOM fan, I own ICOM equipment. If I was to buy an amplifier, for the microphone amplifier, this would be the go-to because it would interface with my ICOM radio. And crucially for me, and this is the point that I think um, clinches it for me, it's got that LAN port on the back. So if you wanted to, let's say you wanted to set up a remote station using purely ICOM gear, you could have, let's say, an IC7610 as your really high quality transceiver. You could have your PW2, both connected to a router, and then back at home, you could connect to that using ICOM's RSBA1 software and have full control of not just your radio, but your amplifier as well. I think that's a really clever solution. I look forward to seeing when it's going to launch. As I say, it was under the glass at Dayton, which generally means we're sort of 12 to 18 months out. So I would imagine we're going to see that launch somewhere around the summer of 2023. Price, who knows at the moment? There's no guidance on it. But let's be honest, we're talking thousands and not hundreds. Uh, I would probably put it in the ballpark of three to four thousand, maybe even slightly over that. Uh, next up are uh, two products that are available almost immediately. Uh, first is a handheld, the second is a mobile. Uh, the handheld is the ICT10, uh, which is a dual band FM handy. And if I'm honest, I'm struggling to get excited about it. Let's just read some of the blurb from the ICOM website. It says here, the ICT10 VHF UHF dual band amateur handheld radio is built to the high quality commercial spec that you would expect from ICOM. Yes, that's absolutely true. The radio features a clear, easy to use layout, rugged commercial build, IP67 dust type specification and waterproofing. Uh, 1500 milliwatts, that's quite loud, loud audio and long lasting lithium ion battery, uh, all making it an ideal radio for beginners and seasoned amateur radio enthusiasts alike. So ICOM with this radio 
is going after that sort of MCOM prepper um, type of buyer, maybe someone who does a lot of Raynet uh, or emergency stuff like that, because it is very much a, a rugged radio. I saw someone comment the fact it was going to be a Balfang killer. I don't think it is for a few good reasons. Number one, I think the Balfang killer already exists in the Yaesu FT4, which is much closer in price to a Balfang and uh, it is certainly a lot better. It comes with a three year warranty, of course, from Yaesu. The ICT-10 I'm struggling with, to be honest with you, because the price point that they're putting it at with a recommended retail price around $260 puts it more towards something like an FT5, not quite there, but certainly up there, than it does a Balfang at the cheap end. Why has Icom done this? Well, I think they've done it because they've realised their handheld lineup was very limited. Essentially, up until now, they've been a one horse race with the ID52. I think the ID31 Plus might still be around, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, but certainly the ID52 has been basically the only option for a dual band handheld. So Icom have tried to do a cheaper radio, knock off uh, D-Star, keep FM, do it nicely, do it rugged. It's just too much. It really is just too much. If that radio was around $170, then I think they'd have a market. I think that would really appeal to someone who wanted a rugged radio with waterproofing, with that dustproofing and all those other features but at a more convenient price point. Uh, I think, unfortunately for Icom, price may be the downfall on this one. I could be wrong, it could be really popular. I personally don't see it selling all that well. Um, the second radio that's available almost immediately is the ICV3500. And I kind of see the point a little more of this than I do the handheld, but it's still a bit of a stretch for me. So the ICV3500 is uh, ICOM's newest amateur FM transceiver for two meters, and it is two meters only. Uh, I shall just read some of the specs here. It's from the ICOM website. Uh, the ICV3500 has a sleek, modern, and easy to read white LCD screen with radio features labeled uh, along the bottom, create easy to read identifiers for the front panel buttons, yada, yada, yada. Here's the things you need to know. 65 watts of RF output power, 4.5 watts speaker, uh, and it's nice and ruggedized with a nice big heatsink. That's great, that's all fine. However, it's a little down on power compared to the sort of Yaesu equivalent, which would be the FT2980, although I will say the FT2980 is physically larger. The screen looks nice from all the videos I've seen. They've gone for that white backlight, so it's closer to either the ID4100 or maybe the ID5100. Um, but again, it's $260. I think if you're after a, a dedicated two meter mobile, this might be an option. I, for that price point, would have liked to have seen it be dual band, but that's just me. Uh, I think it, it will sell better than the handheld. I still don't think it's gonna be a massive seller for Icom. Uh, let's move away from Icom. Let's move to SDR Play, uh, who, of course, a British manufacturer. They produce a number of SDR receivers. Uh, in fact, they produce three. They produce the RSP, that's four. They produce three, the R RSP, a 1A, the RSPDX, and the RSP Duo. Uh, they have been in the business for six or seven years now, I think, uh, and they do very well. But they've not launched any new hardware at Dayton. What they've done is they've launched new software, which is long overdue. So SDR Uno has been their software ever since they launched. And in fact, it predates SDR Play. It was originally an open source project got bought by SDR Play and then SDR Play have developed it for their own hardware. That's all fine, that's all great. However, since day one, SDR Uno has only ever been for Windows. It's never had Mac, Linux or anything else support. So SDR Play are now rewriting Uno, they're calling it SDR Connect, and that's now gonna be cross-platform. So it's gonna be Windows, it's gonna be Mac, it's gonna be Linux, and they've not said explicitly, but I'm really hoping there's also a Raspberry Pi feature. For one thing and one thing alone, in part of SDR Connect, they're now introducing a remote server and client functionality. Now, if you were to pair an SDR, uh, an RSP1A for instance, as well as uh, a Raspberry Pi, put it on a remote site nice and high on VHF, you could use it as a remote receiver. Much in the same way that people already do with the things like the Kiwi SDR, 
and also with the web SDR project. I think this is going to have a significant advantage over both of those though. For the one thing, it's going to be cheaper to do that with a Raspberry Pi and a uh, RSP1A than buying a Kiwi SDR. That's going to be cheaper. But number two, it's also going to have a better performance in terms of the hardware over most of the RTL dongles that are used on the web SDR project. I'm excited to see where this goes. I'm excited to play with it. I don't currently have an SDR play. So uh, John, if you're watching, please come and have one. Uh, and I'd love to play with that because I think that's gonna be great. I think remote operation is uh, is the next big thing in amateur radio. And it's where a lot of people are going and it's where a lot of manufacturers are also putting a lot of investment. Uh, let's talk about some things that we didn't see at Dayton now. Um, we didn't see anything new from Yesu, and to be honest, I wasn't expecting anything new from Yesu. Uh, Yesu tend to release things when they're ready. Uh, they don't tend to uh, demonstrate things in advance of launch. When they're ready to release something, they go ahead and release it. Uh, so we've recently seen from Yesu the uh, FTM uh, 200 and also the FTM 6000. Uh, we've seen those very recently wasn't expecting to see anything new from Yesu here, although I don't think it'll be too long before we see something else new from Yesu. They do tend to release a new radio every few months or so. Uh, and here's the, the really uh, weird one. Uh, Kenwood weren't at Dayton at all. No booth, no stand. I assume some of the dealers were selling their equipment, like HRO and Gigaparts, for instance, uh, maybe DX Engineering, but Kenwood themselves didn't have any presence which I think is interesting. Uh, it's been long rumoured about what Kenwood's future in amateur radio looks like. Uh, and certainly when I was at Martin Lynch and Sons, we were always told by the factory that they are working on something, that they have no plans on leaving. And I think that's true, but I think it's time for Kenwood to announce something, uh, to show the fact that they're not leaving the amateur radio market. Now, it could be that tomorrow they announce something or the day after or next week or next month. But I think it's really interesting that during the pandemic, they discontinued the THD 74, their very popular and very well selling handheld, uh, citing supply issues with the chips and that you know, global chip shortage. Uh, I find that really interesting because ICOM also had the same issue with the IC 7100 and they reworked the design of the 7100 in order to keep it in production. Kenwood didn't do that. Kenwood just pulled the rug under the THD 74 and said, that's it, it's done. Now, maybe the THD 75 is gonna launch later this year. Who knows, that's me speculating, but it'd be nice to see something new from Kenwood. And I think it's a shame they weren't at Dayton, even demonstrating their current lineup. Uh, for them not to be there at all, I think speaks volumes. Now, I'm sure there was lots of other products, new and old, uh, from various manufacturers uh, that hasn't been really well covered that I haven't come across. I think BHI uh, have got a new product. Uh, Graham, if you're watching, maybe you could let me know. I think I saw uh, a video with you uh, demonstrating a new product. So, But I had a look on the BHI website. I couldn't see any mention of any new products there. But... The day is yet young. I'm sure we'll find some more products that have come out of Dayton that have got missed by some of the, the bigger uh, YouTubers and bigger media. And as and when, I'm sure I'll do my best to cover them. Uh, thanks very much for watching this video. Coming up very soon, we're gonna have a video about a portable antenna, uh, which uh, I'm not really gonna explain how to set it up because it's just off the shelf parts. Uh, but so we're gonna see if we can have a little bit of a play with it and see how well it works. Until next time, thanks very much for watching and I'll see you soon. 73, bye-bye.